so that we are prepared for our example. First off, you are going to have to choose between the correct answer to a question or complete a sentence. Now, you're probably familiar with the multiple choice question type in that you are given around three to four options as a response to a question. Usually these options are in the numbered format, so you may see letters A through D. And basically you'll have either a question or a sentence that is incomplete, and you'll have to choose between these options for the correct answer. In some cases, there may be more than one correct answer. Now, it's quite typical just to have one correct answer, but don't be surprised if you come across the multiple choice question that has more than one correct answer. In this case, just make sure you read your directions well and you know what to look out for. Now, in terms of techniques, we're going to use the scanning techniques. If you are familiar with practicing for reading, you are probably familiar with the scanning technique. Basically, you are going to be listening for keywords that we're going to pull out from the questions before we hear the listening prompt. So scanning is listening out for key words, and these words will call our attention and then we'll have to listen for more information once we hear the keywords. We will look at this more in depth in our example. And lastly, we're going to use process of elimination, the very famous POE. Like I said earlier, you're probably familiar with this multiple choice question type since it's quite common in the academic setting or in the university setting or on common tests and quizzes. So basically we're going to eliminate options we know are not correct, and this will give us a higher probability of choosing the correct answer. This is great, especially if you are really stumped on a uh, question and you're not quite sure of the answer. We can use this technique to increase our chances of getting the correct answer, even if the question is very difficult. So these are some common characteristics and features of the multiple choice question type. Now, before we get into our example, I want to take you through these very helpful five steps that we will be using together in order to really tackle this multiple choice question type. You should also use this as a guide when you are practicing on your own and even on test day. So first off, you're going to obviously read the questions before you hear the listening prompt. Now remember, you're going to have around 20 seconds to read the information before you hear the listening prompt. So you definitely want to use this time to your advantage. In just about every listening guide, we're going to suggest that you read the questions first. You definitely want to use those 20 seconds to your advantage. And the second step with time and practice can actually be built in and combined to the first step. So the second step is going to enable you to underline the key words. This is very important. It's ingrained in our scanning technique as well. So in order to use the scanning technique to your advantage, you need to understand what you're listening for. And so you're going to underline the keywords. If you're not quite sure what keywords are, think of it this way. They are the words that make up the idea in your question or in your information. If you were to eliminate these keywords, there wouldn't really be anything pertinent or important in your questions. Again, we will look at this in our step-by-step -step example. But if you're familiar with the reading techniques and pulling out keywords from reading passages, this is the same thing. You're just doing it in your questions. So again, you can combine steps one and two to save on time. And steps one and two will be done before you listen to the prompt. The last three steps will be done at the same time. So we'll also work on our multitasking techniques. All right, so as you're listening to the prompt, you're going to have to take notes on key information. We'll look at this in the next step, but this will sort of depend on the section you are in. So if you're familiar with our overview lesson, there are four sections to the listening portion of the test. So you will know which section you're in before you hear the listening prompt, and the section will dictate what kind of notes you take. So 
don't be alarmed. This information is all in our overview lesson, and you can go over there to find out more about that. But like I said, we'll look at it at the next step. Then when you are answering your questions, you're going to use process of elimination. So like I talked about previously, if you are faced with a very difficult question, you can go ahead and eliminate the options as you go along, and this will increase your chances in getting the correct answer. Multiple choice questions are, are quite helpful because you can use this technique. You can't really use this technique with any other question type for this exam. So really use it to your advantage. And of course, lastly, you want to be accurate. This is sort of something you should keep in mind in general, but always double check your answers if you have time, make sure that you selected the correct number of options or answers, and just make sure that you are writing everything correctly in your answer sheet. All right, now today's example is going to focus on section four. So I'm going to briefly describe some points that you should keep in mind for section four. Now it's going to be a monologue. So what does this mean? It means that one person is going to be speaking for the entire listening prompt. So that is section four. And they're usually going to be speaking about an abstract topic. Now this is most likely going to involve something that you would hear during a university lecture, for example, or something that would be studied in the academic setting. An example of this would be the flight path of a certain type of bird in the winter, okay? And for this reason, section four is known to be the most difficult section in the listening exam. As we know from previous examples and studying the listening test, the sections increase in difficulty. They include both general and academic conversations and lectures. So since this is the last section, it makes the most sense for this to be the most difficult. Now I have this in quotations because it really depends on the test taker and you'll have to practice a few of these to get the hang of it and to really understand whether or not this is the most difficult for you. Just because this has a reputation of being difficult doesn't mean that you specifically will struggle with it, but just keep in mind that this will probably take the most critical thinking and attention. And for that reason, it's very important not to lose track. What I mean by this is since the topic is so abstract, it could be hard to understand and also hard to pay attention to. It isn't a conversation. So a lot of test takers aren't as invested in this section because it's just not known to be very interesting. If you lose track, you're going to miss potential answers since the answers will most likely come in order. So in order to help you stay focused to the listening prompt, we suggest using an outline note system for this section. Now, just to be clear, you'll want to use an outline for listening prompts in section four, regardless of the question type. So it's a really great idea to Prepare yourself before each section's listening prompt is played and know that section four should be connected with taking outlines for the very reason that I mentioned previously. You don't want to lose track and you want to be able to reference something once the listening prompt is played because again, you'll only be able to hear it once. Now, in an outline, uh, we really don't mean writing everything you hear. We mean outlining in terms of connecting to your keywords and making abbreviations, using a nice symbolic system, things that will help you understand what was said in the monologue. And we'll go through this in the next section where we will go through our step-by-step -step example. Okay, so we're prepared. We have our question type, multiple choice, ready and clear, we know our section, let's get started with our example. Here we are with our questions. Now on the left hand side, you will see questions 36 to 40, and we have our multiple choice questions. On the right hand side, I will be writing out the outline. I'll be typing it as we listen to the prompt. This way you can see exactly what I'm focusing on when I'm writing, and this will 
look at keywords and the main points that we will gather from these questions. Something to keep in mind for this step-by-step -step example is that the listening prompt we're going to use today actually has questions 31 through 40. So notice how our example today is 36 through 40. So just keep in mind that we are doing half of the work today, but we're listening to the whole listening prompt. Additionally, you'll have to keep in mind that when we are listening to the directions and when we are utilizing those 20 seconds for reading and underlining keywords, in the real exam, you would have to be doing all of this for questions 31 through 40. So it's sort of double the work. What does this mean? This means that today in our step-by-step -step example, we can take things a bit slower. We can read these together once or twice. We can underline the key words together, but we will be doing so in the order that you would do so in the exam. So we'll listen to the directions first, then we'll pause. We will underline the key words and read the questions. Then we will go back into our listening prompt, take our outline, and then briefly answer the questions. A nice tip to keep in mind is that the directions are pretty much the same. They're quite basic. It will be someone saying that you're going to hear a listening prompt and that you have time to read the questions. This will not change because the structure of the listening test is the same. So what you could do to maximize on your time is to get in the listening mode and read your questions, underline your keywords as the directions are being played. There isn't any key information in the directions that will make a difference in your exam. So go ahead and use that time to your advantage by reading briefly and underlining as many keywords as you can. Okay, now just to remind you, we had our first step, which was read the questions. So in this case, that is everything that is in bold. So 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. And then we're going to underline the key words, which would be words in the questions, words in the answer options. It's quite a lot to do in the amount of time that we are given. But like I said, the more you practice, the more it will become second nature to you, and you'll really pick up on keywords. Today, we'll go through this a bit slower and I'll introduce you to keywords so you know exactly what to look for. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and listen to our instructions. Then we'll pause and start with steps one and two. You will hear a talk on the topic of time perspectives. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Okay, and that is what you would hear in the very beginning of your listening prompt. So let's start with step one, reading the questions. Number 36, we are all present hedonists. Now this is already an excellent keyword. If you're familiar with this, you already have an idea of what the topic for section four would be. If you're not familiar with it, that's fine. You'll just have to keep on reading to get more of an understanding before listening. Number 37, American boys drop out of school at a higher rate than girls because, number 38, present orientated children, number 39, if Americans had an extra day per week, they would spend it, and number 40, understanding how people think about time can help us. Now, a couple of things you'll want to keep in mind here. This multiple choice example is asking you to complete the sentence. Now remember, we looked at the two options earlier. You can either complete a sentence or answer a question. Here we're going to complete a sentence. This is quite common for the exam because you'll hear sentences in the listening prompt and you'll have to figure out which sentence endings are the correct answer. If you have a question, on the other hand, you'll actually have to think a bit more. So that entails more critical thinking skills because you'll have to read the question Think about what you've heard and think about the correct answer. So we're actually quite lucky to have this sentence completion, multiple choice question today. All right, now that was step one, reading the questions. Now we're going to underline our keywords in the questions and also in the answer options. Remember, you can do all of this in one step with more practice. So you could combine steps one and two, and this will really save you on time. With more practice, it'll become second nature. Let's go ahead and underline. We are all present hedonists. Now I've underlined both 
because present describes the type of hedonist, and I'm sure in the listening text, they'll differentiate between a few. So I wanna make sure that we are specific enough to know that it's present. I haven't underlined we are all, because usually you're not going to underline pronouns or the verb to be. This is not important. We just want to focus for the specific information and the information that is necessary to relay the point of this listening prompt. Let's look at our options. We have at school, at birth, while eating and drinking. Now you notice how I haven't underlined at, it is not necessary. I see that school is important, birth is important. I haven't underlined while because it really isn't the point. I just want to think for the keywords eating and drinking. If you think about it, the words at and while will probably be used in this listening transcript many times. We don't need to focus our attention to these words. We want to focus our attention to specific verbs or adjectives or types of people and so on and so forth. Let's go ahead and look at number 37. We see American boys drop out of school at a higher rate than girls because, now here I'm focusing on a nationality because for all we know, the listening prompt could talk about British or Australian or Scottish, we're not sure. So I want to make sure that I am listening for American boys. I've underlined drop out, but I haven't underlined school because my understanding of the word drop out, which is an excellent phrasal verb, already tells me that it has to do with school. This is a great example of how vocabulary can help you as well. You've just saved yourself from underlining school, and you've also just saved yourself an extra word to listen out for. So drop out is an excellent key word here, and higher rate than girls. So I wanna make sure that I'm listening for how boys drop out higher rate than girls. Our answer options, they need to be in control of the way they learn. So here I want to see in control and learn. Need to be is not necessary because I'm listening already for these specific terms. B, they play video games instead of doing schoolwork. Now in this case, again, I know that video games can be played, so I don't need to underline this verb. And C, they are not as intelligent as girls. Okay, great. Let's look at number 38. Present orientated children. Now I'm going to underline present orientated. We've just talked about boys and girls, which is children, so I assume that since the answers will come in order, we'll already be talking about children, so I don't need to underline this necessarily. For A, it says do not realize present actions can have negative future effects. Now, I just want to know that this is going to be negative. So I've underlined not present actions. I have present orientated, so this makes sense to underline and negative future effects. B, are unable to learn lessons from past mistakes. And let's go ahead and look at C, know what could happen if they do something bad, but do it anyway. Now, I, this is very important. Could is a good word to underline because it's the conditional. So if I hear the speaker talking in the conditional or using conditional phrases, this might be the correct answer. Number 39, if Americans had an extra day per week, they would spend it working harder. So I'm going to have working as the keyword, building relationships, and sharing family meals. Now, notice these three words that I've underlined. I've underlined working in A, but building and sharing, the verbs in B and C, I haven't underlined, and I'll tell you why. Working is the key idea for A. So it's going to involve work or going to the office or career. Working is the main thing here. B, the main point is relationships. This is what is specific to B. You can really build anything. You can also share anything. Uh, there are many options for these two words. So the speaker could say perhaps building a career. Who knows? Or building houses for the homeless. It could really be anything. So you want to focus on what is specific. 
The word itself, relationships, is specific enough and can't be used in other ways as building can be used. Family meals are very specific and they can't be used in other ways, but sharing could be used in other ways. So make sure you just think about what is specific. And the last one, understanding how people think about time can help us become more virtuous, work together better, and identify careless or ambitious people, okay? And so same idea here, virtuous is specific, work together is specific, identify people is also specific. All right, so we have just done steps one and two. You might think this took a bit of time. It did, just because I wanted to make sure you understand the rationale behind which words are being underlined, but expect to do this in about 10, 15 seconds in the actual exam, because remember, you will also have another section. Don't worry though, it really will become second nature the more you practice. And even if you are briefly reading and skimming, you already have a nice idea of what the speaker is about to say. So even if you do not underline everything or you don't have time to really think about the specific keywords, that's okay because you've already prepared yourself for what you're about to listen for. You never want to listen blindly. So you never want to just sit at your desk for these 20 seconds and be anxious or think about something else. You really want to use this time to maximize your chances of understanding the listening prompt the first and only time that you will hear it. All right, now we're going to listen to the prompt. And as we do that, I'm going to type out my outline. Afterwards, I'll tell you exactly why I wrote certain things. And then we will use the prompt and the outline to answer our questions. Okay, now I have gone ahead and just cleaned up our underlined keywords just so it's a bit cleaner and a bit more clear. Now, I will be writing out the outline for the listening prompt right here on the right-hand side so you can follow along with me and you can also feel free to use your own outline system. You don't necessarily have to follow the system that I will be using, it's just easier for me. I want you to practice and find what type of system works best for you. Also keep in mind, I'm typing, so if I'm a fast typer, I'm going to be able to write more. You should practice as you are actually going to be writing with a pen or a pencil and paper. So we'll go ahead and listen, follow along as I type, and then we will re-examine after. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, I'm going to be talking about time. Specifically, I'll be looking at how people think about time and how these time perspectives structure our lives. According to social psychologists, there are six ways of thinking about time which are called personal time zones. The first two are based in the past. Past positive thinkers spend most of their time in a state of nostalgia, fondly remembering moments such as birthdays, marriages, and important achievements in their life. These are the kinds of people who keep family records, books, and photo albums. People living in the past negative time zone are also absorbed by earlier times, but they focus on all the bad things, regrets, failures, poor decisions. They spend a lot of time thinking about how life could have been. Then, we have people who live in the present. Present hedonists are driven by pleasure and immediate sensation. Their life motto is to have a good time and avoid pain. Present fatalists live in the moment too, but they believe this moment is the product of circumstances entirely beyond their control. It's their fate whether it's poverty, religion, or society itself. Something stops these people from believing they can play a role in changing their outcomes in life. Life simply is, and that's that. Looking at the future time zone, we can see that people classified as future active are the planners and go-getters. They work rather than play and resist temptation. Decisions are made based on potential consequences, not on the experience itself. A second future-orientated perspective, future fatalistic, 
is driven by the certainty of life after death and some kind of a judgment day when they will be assessed on how virtuously they have lived and what success they have had in their lives. Okay, let's move on. You might ask, how do these time zones affect our lives? Well, let's start at the beginning. Everyone is brought into this world as a present hedonist. No exceptions. Our initial needs and demands, to be warm, secure, fed, and watered, all stem from the present moment. But things change when we enter formal education. We're taught to stop existing in the moment and to begin thinking about future outcomes. But did you know that every nine seconds, a child in the USA drops out of school? For boys, the rate is much higher than for girls. We could easily say, ah, well, boys just aren't as bright as girls. But the evidence doesn't support this. A recent study states that boys in America, by the age of 21, have spent 10,000 hours playing video games. The research suggests that they'll never fit in the traditional classroom because these boys require a situation where they have the ability to manage their own learning environment. Now, let's look at the way we do prevention education. All prevention education is aimed at a future time zone. We say, don't smoke or you'll get cancer. Get good grades or you won't get a good job. But with present oriented kids, that just doesn't work. Although they understand the potentially negative consequences of their actions, they persist with the behavior because they're not living for the future. They're in the moment right now. We can't use logic, and it's no use reminding them of potential fallout from their decisions or previous errors of judgment. We've got to get in their minds just as they're about to make a choice. Time perspectives make a big difference in how we value and use our time. When Americans are asked how busy they are, the vast majority report being busier than ever before. They admit to sacrificing their relationships, personal time, and a good night's sleep for their success. 20 years ago, 60% of Americans had sit-down dinners with their families, and now only 20% do. But when they're asked what they would do with an eight-day week, they say, oh, that'd be great. They would spend that time laboring away to achieve more. They're constantly trying to get ahead, to get toward a future point of happiness. So it's really important to be aware of how other people think about time. We tend to think, oh, that person's really irresponsible, or that guy's power hungry. But often, what we're looking at is not fundamental differences of personality, but really just different ways of thinking about time. Seeing these conflicts as differences in time perspective rather than distinctions of character, can facilitate more effective cooperation between people and get the most out of each person's individual strengths. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, so there we have it. Now, first, before we get into this, let's just take a look at the outline. You see it is not perfect. Uh, there are a lot of abbreviations here. I also have some quick typing, so I'm just going to go ahead and fix that and just make sure that everything is orderly and makes sense. Now, you'll see that some things on the computer appear to be incorrect, but that's just because I have abbreviated them or I have a comma here. This is not important. It's important that you are understanding what is being said. Now, as I was writing this outline, I was also referring back to the questions and the keywords. A lot of things go hand in hand here. And the more you become an expert at the listening section, you can actually go ahead and use process of elimination as you are writing your outline and as you are listening to the prompt. We're going to do it separately today just to make sure that we can look at everything in a clear way. You'll notice that I wrote some of the keywords. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do this when you are listening, but for me, it's just easier to write things as I hear them quickly so that I can reference them later. If you'd like to, this would actually be a very good idea. In a keyword area, so for example, if we look here where we see dropouts, I remember dropouts from question 37 and so I can go ahead and make a little star just so that I know number 37 may 
very well be right here in this answer. This will help me sort of place things in order. Since I see that dropouts is number 37, I can assume that number 36 will most likely be here earlier, and then the last three remaining questions will be after dropouts. This is a great way to use the question order to your advantage, and this can also help you if you feel that you're getting lost in the lecture or the conversation. Again, like I said, you don't have to use this outline section, but it is very helpful to follow the speaker's main points. I was able to understand that time was his main idea. Then he used some phrases like first, second, then. These are connecting words that show the order. And so I was able to make an outline of the first two things he was talking about, present, future, how it affects lives, prevention education, time perspectives, and then the wrap up for understanding. This would be also very helpful for the first part because remember, you'll have two different question types more than likely for each section. So just from looking at this, I can see that numbers 36 through 40 most likely start right here at my Roman numeral five of how they affect lives because this is where the information for these questions lingers. So we could assume that Roman numerals one through four are for the other section. So for right now, we're going to just not pay any attention to this. We're going to focus on five and everything that comes after that. Also, before we get into the answers, you'll see that I used arrows. So I have an arrow here and I have an arrow here. This is basically to connect these two ideas. So for example, the speaker was talking about dropouts and then he connected that to talking about boys. Uh, at the end, he talked about understanding time perspectives and connected that to thinking about time. Now, since we are focusing on affect lives and later, I'm going to just erase the top portion here. And I'm also going to leave some space for the transcript just so that we can reference the transcript and what was said when looking at our answer. All right, so I've changed it up a little bit. This is the area that we will focus on. And then I also have our transcript so that we can actually understand the answers. I would encourage you to go back and listen and perhaps even answer using process of elimination before the explanation. But you can also just follow along and understand why the answers are the way they are based on the outline notes and the transcript. So let's get started with number 36. Now, we see here we are all present hedonists or hedonists as the speaker says also this is a good time to note that you'll definitely hear different types of accents so whereas one person will pronounce a word a certain way another accent or another person may use a different pronunciation so just keep that in mind as well all right now we see we are all present hedonists here and I did not write an important keyword on purpose because I wanted to show you how to use process of elimination if you really don't know the answer. Now, there is a keyword that I could have written here, but let's say I didn't and I don't remember because I was listening to an earlier section or I wasn't paying attention. We have the options school, birth, eating, and drinking. The information below this talks about education and it talks about boys. So I know that number 37 will be right around here, but I can distinctly remember that we did not talk about eating and drinking in this area. The speaker did talk about family meals later on, so I can effectively eliminate C since this was not talked about. And since we talk about school immediately after, this was a change in topic. So I could also effectively eliminate A. The word I did not write was brought into, and that is right here. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you how this keyword helped me figure out number 36. I'll go ahead and just make the correct phrase bold so that you can see the answer. So it says, everyone is brought into this world as a present hedonist, no exceptions. This right here 
could tell me that B is the correct answer because not everybody goes to school. So that would be an exception. If you say only people who go to school are present hedonists, that really doesn't make sense. So I could eliminate A. And also if we keep listening on, it says our initial needs and demands warm, secure, fed, and watered. These are all things that have to do with being born, being a baby. And so B would be the correct answer here. All right, let's move on to number 37. We will check our notes and we're looking at education, dropouts. And so I have number 37 here. Now it says boys play more video games and that just doesn't fit well in the traditional classroom. And then this last phrase here, boys need to manage learning. So even though we have video games, which is a key word that we underline in B, this isn't necessarily the reason why the American boys drop out of school at a higher rate. The speaker said that it was because they need to manage their learning. This is a very common trick in the IELTS exam to include something that is definitely not the answer. Now, number 37 is actually quite difficult. I would say it's probably the most difficult question in this section because we have the keyword of video games and video games is in B, but then we have C, which says boys need to manage learning. And managing is a synonym for in control. Now, I haven't written anything about intelligence, but the speaker does say something about boys not being as bright as girls. So basically, the speaker has given us three clues for A, B, and C, making process of elimination that much more difficult. But you really need to pay attention to this last point, boys need to manage their learning, which would correspond to A. They need to be in control of the way they learn. Let's go ahead and look at exactly what the speaker said. So I'm going to go to number 37 in our transcript and just make that bold for you to see. And it says, the research suggests that they'll never fit in the traditional classroom because these boys require a situation where they have the ability to manage their own learning environment. Here you see a classic explanation. So they won't fit in the traditional classroom because they need to manage their own learning environment. And if we look before that, the speaker does talk about dropouts, which is right here. A classic trick in the IELTS exam is to provide one or two keywords or clues that are not the answer and then the answer. So let's look at this. It says here, dropouts and boys. So we're listening for number 37. And it says, we could easily say, ah, well, boys just aren't as bright as girls, but the evidence doesn't support this. So this means that even though number C is sort of included in this phrase here, the speaker immediately says that is not the case. So if we're listening along, writing our notes, and reading our keywords, we could eliminate C as the first option. Then we go on to read, a recent study states that boys in America by the age of 21 have spent 10,000 hours playing video games. This corresponds to B in a way because this statement doesn't necessarily say that boys are playing video games instead of doing schoolwork. So B is actually not the case as per the transcript. So we can also eliminate B. And so that leaves us with A, which corresponds to this last point here, and it also corresponds to number 37, which is right here in bold. It's a lot of work to do as you listen. And that's why keeping your outline can actually help you because you can use the time during the transcript but also immediately after to just check your notes and quickly eliminate anything or to eliminate any doubts that you have. So bottom line, we see that A is the correct answer. I'll just clear our screen to make things a bit easier to read and let's go on to the next question. So we see present orientated children and this would take me right here, prevention education. So I see here that 
present-oriented children are persistent with their behavior. They don't live for the future. They live in the moment. And so since nothing was said about the past, I can effectively eliminate B because nothing was discussed regarding the past. And so we have to decide between A and C because A does have the keyword of future, which was in our outline, but we also have C, which talks about the conditional and the fact that these children know what could happen if they do something bad. And I remember that the speaker said that these children understand future consequences, but they're living in the moment. So the fact that they can understand their consequences would also eliminate A. And if we were thinking about this as the speaker was actually going through the lecture, we could focus right here in the transcript. Let's take a look. It says, although they understand the potentially negative consequences of their actions, they persist with the behavior because they're not living for the future, they're in the moment right now. And so that is a great clue to show us that C is the correct answer. Let's go ahead with number 39. Now, number 39 was right around here in our last section, and we were talking about Americans. So this is a great keyword. We see it in our outline and also in the question, and it talked about 60 versus 20. We can not even worry about that because that was not in our question. And it says here, more work, sacrifice for success. Now, the fact that the speaker said eight day week, this is a synonym for extra day per week, since we know we have seven days in a week. And just the fact that we see here more work corresponds directly to A, working harder, because the speaker didn't really necessarily talk about building relationships. The speaker did mention sharing family meals, which again is a trick that the IELTS exam will have, because you'll hear the keyword and then the speaker will immediately talk about why that is not the answer. And we can see that right here. The speaker says they admit to sacrificing their relationships, personal time, and a good night's sleep. And then it said here also dinners with families. But right here, this is the excellent clue. But asked what they would do with an eight-day week, they say they would be laboring away. And notice how the speaker used the word labor instead of work. Another common trick is to use these synonyms. So let me just go ahead and show you the correct answer. I'll put it in bold just so that we can read it and that it is clear. We see eight day week, time laboring away. So this is the correct answer for 39. And lastly, let's go ahead and look at number 40, which we have as just a sentence here, understand, thinking about time, cooperation, and strengths. The fact that I've written cooperation makes me think of working together. And again, nothing was necessarily discussed regarding virtue. I didn't write this word. It didn't stick out to me, so we can eliminate that. Careless or ambitious people was discussed, but it isn't the correct answer. Let's look here at the transcript. Seeing these conflicts as differences in time perspective rather than distinctions of character can facilitate more effective cooperation. So there's our keyword again, between people and get the most out of each person's individual strengths. Now this relates clearly to B, but remember if you go a little bit above here, the speaker mentions people being irresponsible or power hungry, and this may cause people to select See, but it's very important to listen for these main key words because the last sentence here really summed up the transcript and gave us an answer to number 40 because understanding how people think about time will help us facilitate cooperation. This is a really good key word. So you see how we used the outline to our advantage process of elimination for a case where we may not have known the answer, and really effective key words. Now remember, today we separated all of these steps. So we read the questions first, then we underlined our key words, then we listened and made our outline, et cetera, et cetera. During the actual exam and when you practice, you should try to do all of these things at the same time. This way you can answer as quickly as possible 
and really get your mind into the test taking mentality. Let's go ahead and wrap up this lesson. Okay, now let's wrap up this lesson. We did a lot today, so let's just go over some handy do's and don'ts. First off, you want to utilize your time. So utilize those 20 seconds that you have prior to hearing your listening prompt. Read your questions, underline your keywords, and then actively listen for those keywords during the prompt. Also remember, the order. Now, answers will most likely come in order, and this means that your notes can help you. Like you saw earlier, I was able to identify where number 37 was, and based off of that information, I was able to understand where the answers were in my outline. Of course, speaking of outlines, you want to find a technique that works for you. This will take practice, this will take time. Just because I used a very detailed formal type of outline doesn't mean that that would work best for you, but if it does, great. So just make sure you practice outlining and multitasking, and of course, taking notes and using process of elimination for the multiple choice question. Then for your don'ts, you don't want to waste time. Obviously, you only have a certain amount of time to listen, to write, take notes, and answer your questions, so use it wisely. And you don't want to focus on one thing. So don't just listen, don't just read, and don't just answer. You'll need to combine these three tasks in order to have enough time to complete everything. Now today, we did do everything step by step just so it's clear for you. Now, when you practice on your own, feel free to combine these steps and really maximize your time. Also, you don't want to immediately answer because you saw that the IELTS listening exam will throw you some curveballs and some difficult situations where you may hear a keyword, but that usually isn't the first option. So always remember that the exam will throw you perhaps a few keywords and then the speaker will follow up and tell you why that isn't the correct answer. So definitely listen for that. And lastly, you don't want to leave anything blank because you won't necessarily lose points for getting something incorrect. So if you're really stumped, you might as well just try. If it isn't correct, you just won't get a point. So thanks again.